Hopefully you enjoyed that bit of a palate cleanser looking at a year's worth of satellite weather data um, from 2020. The 2021 data haven't come out, the, the video hasn't come out yet. But in this section, I want to talk about the relationship between relative poverty and conflict as well as absolute um, poverty and conflict. And in that, I'm focusing on the third reading for this week by Buhaug uh, et al., another uh, influential article uh, that started or what is a good representative of the growing trend at that time of subnational studies of uh, civil conflict, because I think the their critiques are relevant to our understanding of economic causes of conflict. And the first is that um, the country is at too abstract of a level of analysis to truly understand the relationship between economic factors and conflict. Countries can be big and diverse. I mean, India and Myanmar both at one time had six ongoing conflicts. India is a much bigger country than Myanmar is, and there is um, a number of areas in uh, India like uh, that are much more developed than other parts of the uh, of the continent and so where conflict happens if what happens in Assam might not necessarily affect economic production across the country uh, in um, in Delhi or Mumbai right and so they argue that conflicts are likely to break out in areas both with low absolute income and those areas that deviate from the national average. Uh, deviations, um, both they have hypotheses both of positive and negative deviations. You might have, you can make arguments for why a country, uh, parts of the country that are richer than a national average are more likely to see conflict given our discussion of the Collier and Hoffler um, rational choice model of the benefits of, of conflict. But then you can also say there's uh, potential grievance arguments for uh, areas of low development compared to the national level uh, leading to conflict, right? So you can see um, that if you uh, relax the assumption of a unitary state that that helps us better understand why conflicts break out and that you're missing part of the puzzle by assuming that uh, the country's economic production is spread evenly across the country and lo looking at the Indian example as uh, Buhag et al. do in their article shows quite dramatic levels of um, state production per capita across uh, across different parts of the uh, of the country and there's a lot of dif it's difficult to measure some things um, at lower levels of analysis gdp and population are really popular in a whole host of uh, areas that trying to understand why countries become democracies, why they are more likely to lead to conflict, a whole host of other of uh, other outcomes, because in a lot of ways they're easy to measure. So there's a streetlight effect. You're likely to use or look for answers for questions in areas in which you are able to get good data. But over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a whole host of research efforts at trying to relax the assumption and the level of aggregation you can look at by looking within countries to see what potentially is more influential than national averages is these kind of regional or more direct averages. And there's also better ever better efforts at trying to move from the medieval tools level of um, proxies for a lot of the factors we're looking at and come up with better measures. And I, one example of this would be night lights. How bright an area is at night is often is seen as a robust predictor of how developed a particular part of the world is. So this is data from 2012 um, from the Peace Research Institute Oslo's effort at trying to look at subnational causes of conflict. And you can see the US, Europe, um, uh, India, China, Japan, uh, areas that are incredibly bright, bright at night are also areas that have had higher levels of economic development. And there's no, but then you also see other areas that have low levels of development, like a large swaths of Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of uh, Australia, Brazil, 
which uh, also highlight the important the importance of where population actually lives. Right, you could have a clustering of uh, both people and economic production hypothetically in the eastern part of Australia, and that could lead to night lights in certain areas, showing that there's more economic production there, but there's also more people there uh, as well, which are, you can make an argument to whether they're driven by the jobs there, by history, or what are the reasons for motivating them. But I think one effort to try to show the importance of policy at its starkest is the difference in lights between North and South Korea, because there you can make an argument that until 1950, this was a, a population that was relatively homogenous, that lived um, in all parts of the, uh, of the um, peninsula, and now um, you see some few lights in uh, Pyongyang and along the coast, but there is a striking difference in the amount of night lights. Um, in uh, South Korea as compared to, uh, to North Korea. And so there you can make an argument that there is just an absolute difference in level of uh, development for North Korea. There just isn't that much economic activity there going on um, and capacity for, for people. Um, but then you can also make a relative argument comparing North Korea to South Korea, right? So when you're talking about um, economic drivers of conflict and uh, and uh, Buhag et al. talk about this. It's important to kind of look about look at the difference between relative and absolute inequality. Um, and you can see since uh, 2000, there really has been um, uh, that kind of inflection point in which you do have um, levels of economic development are getting better, but like the relative measures are really, uh, really spiking. Um, which kind of shows that uh, the relative inequality and this kind of video from or uh, this uh, aerial picture from Mexico City, I think, kind of shows these neighborhoods um, contrasted the developed side on the right and the less developed side on the left grew up in Los Angeles. You could, you could probably take similar pictures, maybe not quite as dramatic uh, there. Often people use aerial photos of um, one island in the Caribbean, half of which is split uh, between the um, Dominican Republic, which is more developed uh, than Haiti, as ways to kind of look at differences and the importance of political decision making and political leadership. And I think in this class, it's going to be important to talk about inequality and how it's divided. It's both relative, absolute, but then also that inequality can can exist horizontally or vertically. Um, vertical inequality consists of inequality amongst individuals or households, uh, right? So you have some people that are really well off and others that have less. Well, horizontal inequality is inequality amongst groups, typically culturally defined uh, by ethnicity or religion or race. So um, vertical inequality is just comparing the elites to the masses potentially, while um, as individuals, while the um, horizontal inequality uh, would be uh, uh, between groups and as a dr as a driver for conflict often it is a factor of um, of uh, uh, group horizontal inequality uh, in which you have um, the control of the public purse leading to systematically different levels of investment in certain areas and certain groups for certain regions and that can leave incentives for um, for rent seeking for individual behavior that can be harder to justify and the scale and scope of can be hard to understand unless you um, have a peek behind the curtain and I think for me the, a clear example of this would be in Nigeria, in which um, back in 2017, an apartment was raided, and in it they found uh, in excess of like um, of $40 million in cash. It ended up coming out that this uh, apartment was controlled, allegedly, by the head of um, intelligence uh, in Nigeria as a way to try to have cash to be able to, to buy informants and to be able to use this kind of um, uh, off-the-books um, economic spending to be able to head off or avoid conflict uh, or to get information to make sure that because it's also an area that's had uh, civil conflict, natural resource challenges, which we're going to talk about later on the semester. Um, but it's just pretty rare in countries that have a GDP per capita of, of uh, 
a few thousand dollars or less. And when you have these stacks of US $100 bills, it can be quite dramatic. And I think for me, um, this is a tension between levels and change, right? It's, it, it's, a, it's all about whether it's the level of development matters for people as individuals or states, or is it how that capacity changes over time, like in the Miguel et al. piece with economic growth? Or it could also be how much this this money is actually worth, right? Um, a couple of years ago when I first did this, I went to the Mint uh, here in Canberra to be able to um, show you how um, economic capacity can be uh, achieved through printing or non non printing of money, but that also can depend on the capacity of the state to regulate that spending or control it in order to make sure that this money keeps value, right? And I have one of the things to collect when you travel around the world is random currencies. I kept some of the smaller bills, uh, the bigger ones you always exchange at the airport, right? Or at least I do. Um, but in economic capacity and looking at it over time, I I think. Another thing that isn't talked about necessarily as much is purchasing power, right? We're going to see purchasing power parity as a proxy for um, how much people can buy with their money. And with the Australian dollar um, on the graph down on the right compared to the U.S. dollar, it has been ups and downs, downs around 2000 ups right around the time when I moved to Australia in 2013. It was more this $1 um, in Australia bought more than $1 in the US. Now it is down around 72 cents. Uh, so that's a fluctuation right, of 30% just in a couple of years. However, that's nothing compared to some of the other countries I've been to um, in Zimbabwe. When the country became independent and the Rhodesian dollar was replaced by the Zimbabwean dollar, um, this was this would have been worth 100 US dollars, right? Now, uh, in when I visited uh, Zimbabwe in 2000, 2001, it was 2001, um, one Zimbabwean dollar was buying one US cent. So this went in 20 years from being worth 100 US dollars to one US dollar. And in a couple of years, it went from 2000, 2002 down to um, being worth 10 US cents to being worth one cent and being worth basically nothing in 2006, in which they had to replace this with a new uh, Zimbabwean dollar. And then um, eventually another one a couple of years later that government's decisions and devaluing the currency can have a large effect on people's lives, kind of like with the Russian ruble right now that went down 30% with the outbreak of the uh, of the Ukrainian war. Uh, another example that occurred to me that I lived through in my life, uh, also I was in Russia in 98, right after the um, the Asian financial crisis in which the ruble also was, in, was hit uh, quite dramatically. So you can recover, some recover over time, like with the Australian dollar, others do not. Uh, Turkish lira, right, when I was there, well, in 1980, when Turkish lira bought a little over one U.S. cent, by 95 when I was there, uh, it took 10,000 Turkish lira for 23 cents. So this would have been worth 23 cents uh, when I was there in 1995. And five years later, it was basically worth less than uh, less than two cents. So it's, it is incredibly difficult for people who have their wealth tied to a specific currency or uh, savings to be able to uh, deal with these kind of macro level shocks. And that could reduce the opportunity cost to joining uh, a rebel group or create grievances. It could have a whole bunch of different um, uh, different factors that's important to kind of take, a, take into account when you're talking about, as we'll do in this class, these large group level explanations or country level explanations. These individual bills, like I remember in um, Uzbekistan, I had to, to travel with packs of uh, cash to be able to to pay for hotels and, and transport just because the money had become so incredibly devalued over time, um, that these individual peoples with individual purchasing decisions and individual difficulties can shape these kind of national level um, outcomes that we look at in this class. A couple of other quick weaknesses. Um, Bauhaus. <laughs> it's going to be Buhog. Um, not going to get into uh, um, design at all. Anyway, Buhog et al. 2011 et al. They use cross-sectional models, kind of like Collier and Hoffler, so we can't assess changes over time. I honestly don't know in the last decade whether anyone's done pooled um, studies of economic development and 
conflict within uh, within India to see if there really is overtime effects. That'd be interesting. And they didn't include all instances of areas without conflict. They just chose a random selection of them. And so that raises the question for whether the sample that they had was generalizable to the rest of the country. Any kind of these these kind of they seem technical decisions, but they can have important substantive effects to the conclusions that we reach. And then also, um, I showed you the substantive effect in Miguel, Miguel et al. article of rainfall growth on conflict to really understand the size of the effect. The substantive effect here in the Buhag et al. article is unclear, and that kind of makes you question how important the relationship is substantively. It could be statistically significant, but the effect could be really tiny in the level of, um, of uh, inequality on, on conflict. So anyway, uh, just to kind of compare the um, the uh, the Miguel et al. piece and the Buhag et al. piece, they both, and actually all three, they all use rationalist approaches, looking at costs and benefits of the use of violence, something we're going to see over the next couple of weeks as well. They focus more on modeling as opposed to theory, right? The first uh, week's readings... Um, we're focused on the theoretical reasons for conflict. These ones are kind of taking, uh, from a starting point, the kind of basic rational choice models of, of uh, economic motivations for war, and then kind of modeling it, and their measurement choices in that modeling is less than ideal. So if are there any other th similarities or theories that you can think about? Save them for the workshop or leave them in the comments below. It'd be interesting to, to see uh, your thoughts. Uh, and with that, yeah, it's uh, all focusing on these causal mechanisms reminded me of the Charlie Chaplin uh, scene in Modern Times in which you have a whole bunch of incredibly complex moving parts and you have to choose which one to focus on with your own specific set of tools. So now let's go ahead and move on to a discussion of human security before talking about our case study of Burundi.